Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like, I'd like to welcome you all to our 20th session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya. And we left off at verse number 95, <clears throat> where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa haramun ala qaryatin ahlakanaha annahum la yarji'oon. Allah says, after speaking about the believers and how their efforts will be preserved, Allah then speaks about those who were wicked, who transgressed, and who were punished by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their iniquities. And He says, and it is forbidden upon any town that we have destroyed that they should ever return. Now, when Allah says ala qaryatin that it is forbidden here, it means that this is the, the sunnah of Allah, that when a nation is destroyed, they will never return. Now, return to what? There's a blank, right? So the, the ayah says, Annahum la yarji'un, but the, the object is, is not mentioned, and therefore. Some of the commentators, they say that what the verse means is that they shall never return to this life after they taste the punishment and they are destroyed for their transgressions. There is no way for them to come back to this life, that there is now a barrier. And this seems to be consistent with other verses in the Quran where it seems that the kuffar were the, the sinners, the wicked, they, they plea and they beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return them to this earthly life. For example, in Surah Al-Mu'minun, verses 99 and 100, Allah says, الموت, When death comes to any of them, قَالَ O oh my Lord, take me back, send me back, let me return, meaning let me return to this life. And the answer, that, and the reason is why, so that I can do some good uh, with respect to what I've left behind. But what is the answer? It's a very resounding no. It's an emphatic no. This is a statement that these people will utter. وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Now there is a barrier that cannot be breached. They cannot go back to the, uh, to the earthly life. So, أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Some say that it means that they will never return to the earthly life. There are other commentators that say, أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ That it is forbidden upon any town that we have destroyed, that they should ever return. Here, some say that it means that they should return to God, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never punish a nation, a community, a town, a group of people if they have the potential to return to Him, if they have the potential to repent. And this is also supported by a, a verse in the Quran. So you see, you have two groups of commentators who have their own evidence. Some say, أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Meaning, they will never come back to al hayat dunya this earthly life. Others say, أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Could also mean that they, they, they will never return back to God because they've deviated. What is their evidence? They say there is a divine policy that is mentioned in the Qur'an, a divine sunnah. In Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 33, where Allah mentions two things that protect people from the descent of divine punishment. So there are two safety nets that are mentioned. Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ That Allah would never punish them while you are among them meaning the Prophet. So one, one protective, one safety net, one form of protection from 
divine punishment is the mere presence of the Prophet. So the presence of the Prophet because he's Rahmas and Alameen, Allah doesn't you know destroy na entire nations in the way that uh, they were destroyed in the past. So the Prophet's presence is a source of security and safety for them from divine punishment. And then secondly, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبُهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And God would not punish them as long as they are seeking His forgiveness. So if there is the potential for tawbah, punishment does not come down. So there are two ways of reading this verse. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ and it is forbidden upon any town that we destroy that they should ever return to this earthly life. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that, and it is forbidden upon any town that we have destroyed that they should ever return to God, meaning that there is no potential left in them for repentance and self-reformation. Now, there is a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where he uses this verse to explain a, an idea, a doctrinal belief within the Shia school, and that is the idea of raj'ah. Ah. The idea that before the Day of Judgment, there will be a type of resurrection that takes place in this life where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revives the most wicked and he revives the most righteous so they can so they can witness the final triumph of truth over falsehood there's a hadith from imam sadiq where he says kullu qaryatin ahlakallahu ahlaha bil adhab la yarjuuna fi raja the imam says all of the towns that were destroyed because of divine punishment, they will not return during the raj'ah, ah, during this minor resurrection that will happen before the Day of Judgment. On the Day of Judgment, everyone will be resurrected. So the Imam says there, there are two groups of people who will return. That the Imam al-Sadiq is saying that this ayah is a reference to the idea that those who have been punished and the nations that were destroyed, they will not return. But there are those who will return and they are those who are the embodiment of faith. And this is also alluded to in the ziyarat. And I believe in your return. And it also means that the most wicked will also return and witness the victory of truth over falsehood. So, but again, that is a, that is a ta'wil of the ayah. That's not a tafsir of the ayah. Now, ayah number 96, and this is, you know, one of the most, difficult verses I would say in the surah to, to understand and that is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says ayah number 96 hatta idha hatta idha futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj wa hum min kulli hadabin yansilun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says till the time Ya'juj or Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are unleashed and they rush down from every hill. So it, the dominant opinion with respect to the previous verse is that it is and it is forbidden upon any town that we have destroyed that they should ever return. Now everyone re will return on the day of judgment. And one of the signs, one of the eschatological signs of the Day of Judgment is the unleashing of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Now, 
who are these, what are these uh, names? Who does Ya'juj and Ma'juj refer to? So this is actually one of the signs which is explicitly mentioned in the Quran about the day of judgment as a sign that the day of judgment is, is approaching. Now, in order to understand who Ma'juj and Ma'juj were, we have to go and we have to cross-reference some verses from Surah Al-Kahf because Ya'juj and Ma'juj are also mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. At the end of Surah Al-Kahf, uh, in the story of Dhul Qarnayn, now, Dhul Qarnayn was a, a righteous, a pious king, and there's a huge debate among the commentators of the Quran regarding his identity. I don't want to I don't want to go into that because there's no consensus. Some have speculated that this is a reference to Alexander the Great. Some have mentioned other, you know, uh, prominent figures in history. The reality is we don't know. We don't know the identity of this personality. But the point is. And Dhul Qarnayn is a title, it's not the actual name of the individual. But I want to go through uh, verses 93 to 97 very quickly, just so we have an understanding of uh, the history of these two uh, uh, vicious tribes. <clears throat> so if we go to ayah number 93 from Surah Al-Kaf, Surah number 18, ayah number 93, Dhul Qarnayn used to travel and, you know, he... He ruled over a considerable part of the civilized world at the time. And he would travel with his army, with his military. And the ayah says, Hatta idha balagha bayna saddain wajada min dunihima qawman la yakaduna yafqahuna qawla. So Dhul Qarnayn is traveling with his, his army, with his men, with his entourage till he reached the place between two mountain barriers. Now again, we don't really know where these mountain barriers are. Many Mufassirin say that, you know, this is a mountain barrier that is uh, between modern day uh, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Again, we're not sure uh, about the exact geographical location, but the point is he was passing through this, this mountain passage he found, the ayah says, he found beyond them a people who could barely comprehend speech. So he meets, you know, these very primitive people or people who spoke this, you know, strange language. He was able, he, they were barely able to understand the language that Dhul Qarnayn spoke, either because they just were not, they didn't have a developed language or they had a very unique language and they were very isolated from the outside world. In any case, they, when they see Dhul Qarnayn and all of his, his power and his might, they ask him for a favor. In some way, they're able to communicate, maybe through gestures, they're able to communicate. So who do they complain about? They complain about these these two tribes, these two groups of people known as Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And they say to Dhul Qarnayn that they are spreading corruption in our land. We're being pillaged and they're raiding us and they're causing us harm and they're killing. فَهَلْ نَجْعَلْ لَكَ خَرْجًا عَلَىٰ أَن تَجْعَلَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ سَدَّىٰ Shall we pay you a tribute, you know, can we offer you money so that you may set a barrier between them and us? So they ask Dhul Qarnayn to build some type of structure to, to confine Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So they offer him money. So, but look at how God-fearing he is. You know, he doesn't just take advantage and say, yeah, you know, give me X amount of uh, wealth and I'll, I'll do it for you. All he says, he says, قَالَ مَا مَكَّنِّي فِيهِ رَبِّي خَيْرٍ That Allah has, what Allah has given me is better than what you can give me. So he, he doesn't even accept their money. He says, I don't need your money. What he asks them is, فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةٍ أَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ رَدْمًا Dhul Qarnayn says, I just need manpower. 
I need workers. I need people who can put in manual labor. And I will build for you a rampart or a, a type of barrier between you and them. So he says to them, in, the, in ayah number 96, Atuni zubur al-hadid, bring blocks of iron. So it, it seems that iron was available. He says to them, bring blocks of iron. Hatta idha sawa bayna sadafain, they filled the the gap between the uh, the mountain barriers. He says, blow, blow on it, heat it, blow on it. It will become, it will become like fire. And then he says, And then the Qarnayn says, I will pour in this area between these two mountains, a, he'll pour molten brass. So he, he created this, this super barrier between them and between Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And in the final ayah, it says, فَمَسْطَاعُوا and يَظْهَرُوا So Ya'juj and Ma'juj were no longer able to climb that barrier. وَمَسْتَطَاعُوا لَهُ نَقْبَى And they were, neither were they able to poke any holes in this, in this barrier. Now, the question is here, if this is a reference to, to, to two tribes, here the Qur'an is saying that ayah number 96 of Surah Al-Anbiya says, till the time that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are unleashed and they rush down from every hill. So it seems that one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is that the thing that is confining them, the thing, that, you know, because they were quarantined essentially by the Qarnayn, that barrier will be breached and they will flow down from every hillside. The word hadab means an elevated place and yensilun means that they will pour down the hills just like water, you know, just like an avalanche or a mudslide. Now, who is who are these tribes? Now, again, as you can imagine, there's a lot of discussion among the Mufassirin about the identity of these two tribes. Some have speculated that you know this is the this these tribes are the descendants of uh, the of one of the offspring of Nuh, which is really not very helpful to us. Others say that Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are two destructive uh, tribes and they are derived, for example, uh, Ya'juj is derived from the, the word Ta'ajuj, which means to ignite with fire. And Ma'juj is derived from the word Mawj, which means the waves of the ocean or, or the waves of the sea, which basically means two destructive forces. So this verse seems to indicate that at the one of the signs of the end of times is that two destructive forces will be unleashed on humanity. Now if we if we take the literal meaning of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, it seems that one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is the destruction of humanity by fire and the destruction of humanity through water. Now, when I was reading this verse, again, only Allah knows, but it's this could be a reference, and again. This is just a possibility. We're not saying anything definitively that this could be a reference to the the issue of climate change. You know, for example, you see the the forest fires that are you know that are destroying uh, you know large sections of the world. You know, the, the the burning of the Amazon, other parts of the world, and you and you also see what the the problem of the melting of the ice caps. So one could, one could 
speculate, again, this is just a theory, that Ya'juj and Ma'juj could mean that one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is that humanity will be destroyed through fire and through water, through, through our own activities and how we've exacerbated this problem of uh, global warming. Again, that's just, that's just my own uh, theory and Allah knows best. Now, we do have some ahadith from, uh, from some of the companions of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, where, for example, in Tafsir al-Qummi, Abu Basir, who was a student of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq, he says, and it seems that he's either quoting from the fifth or the sixth Imam, he says, إِذَا كَانَ قَبْلَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Before the Day of Judgment, في آخر الزمان, at the end of times, إِنْ هَدَمَ ذَلِكَ السَّدْ That barrier that was confining Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be breached. وَخَرَجَ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ إِلَى الدُّنْيَا وَأَكَلُ النَّاسِ the, the narration says that there are these barbaric creatures that inhabit a certain part of the world. They are confined. Now, we don't know about them. We don't know where they are exactly. But this barrier will be breached. And these individuals, and we don't know if they're, if they're human, if they're if they're the descendants of another part of the uh, of the you know the primitive human tree if we want to call it that but the point is this hadith says that these individuals are actually cannibals who will descend upon villages and cities in large numbers and they will devour everything in sight including human beings so there will be mass cannibalism according to this hadith that will that will uh, appear at the end of time. So the emergence of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. Now, ayah number 97. الْوَعْدُ الْحَقِّ فَإِذَا هِيَ شَاخِصَةٌ أَبْصَارُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا and the true promise draws close. Here the true promise means the day of judgment. And behold, there shall be the fixed stare of those who disbelieved. Oh, woe unto us. We have certainly been heedless of this, rather we are wrongdoers. So the true promise here, so yeah, the emergence of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is a sign of the day of judgment. The day of judgment then arrives and Allah says, he speaks about the eyes of the disbelievers on the day of judgment. And, and here, again, it's important to state that Alladina kafaru is not just anyone who's a disbeliever. These are people who intentionally, who deliberately denied the truth. Allah says, فَإِذَا هِيَ شَاخِصَةٌ أَبْصَارُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا The day of judgment will be such, you know, it will be such a horrifying scene to them that they will not be able to move their eyes. You know, when something is so stunning and something is so, you know, bewildering, it is so overwhelming that you can't take your eyes off of it. So Allah says what they will see is so incredible, so incomprehensible that they will not be able to avert their gaze. They will be stunned. You know, have you ever seen someone who's in shock, who's stunned? They have a blank stare. They, they can't even move their eyes. Their eyes are fixed. Allah is describing their eyes, saying that what they will witness on the day of judgment is so stunning that it will be as though there are, there are blank stares. They won't be able to divert 
their gaze. Their, their stares will be fixed. Their glances will be fixed. And there's an admission of guilt. What's interesting is that on the day of judgment, they, no one, they don't point the finger and say, you know, I've been wronged. You know, this is a sham trial. You know, I'm a victim. No one plays, you know, they don't play the victim card. They blame themselves. Indeed, we were certainly, we have certainly been heedless of this. You know, notice they don't even, they don't say we've been heedless of the day of judgment or we've been heedless of the day of reckoning. They say we have been heedless of this. Now, the, the reason why I say they say we've been heedless of this, it's because they're, they're in a state of shock, that they're not even able to articulate or describe what they're seeing. And not only that, they say, Rather, not only were we, you know, we weren't just heedless. We were wrongdoers. We were valimin. We wronged ourselves. You know, this, is, this wasn't a matter of, oh, we just didn't know. They admit that they're heedless, but they even take it a step further and they say that we were valimin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't wrong anyone on the Day of Judgment. Now again, speaking about the condition of these people on the Day of Judgment, Allah in Surat an nazi'at I, uh, verses 8 and 9, he describes the hearts of these people, of the wrongdoers, and he describes their eyes. He says, Allah says, on the day of judgment, their hearts will be trembling. You know, ha have you ever felt your heart race when you're panicking, Palpit heart palpitations? Your heart is racing. You feel like your heart is going to explode. Allah says, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ وَاجِفَةٌ That the hearts will be racing on that day. Because this is the day of judgment. This is the day where you're going to have to answer to God. This is the day where everything that you've done is now before your eyes. أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعَةٌ And Allah says that their eyes will be humbled. That you will see humility in their eyes. Some understand this meaning that their eyes will be lowered in humiliation. So this is this is a difficult day, brothers and sisters. You know, I'll just uh, share with you a a couple of uh, of narration. Actually, just one narration. Someone asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, you know, about the, the ayah, I believe in Surat, uh, Surat Abasa, where the ayah says that on the day of judgment, that everyone will be preoccupied on the day of judgment. That you will be running away from your siblings, your, your parents, your spouse, you will disavow all of them. That you're going to have nothing. You, you don't want to have anything to do with anyone. Everyone is going to be preoccupied. So some some people ask the Prophet that will will will, will people remember their families on the day of judgment? You know, usually when when there's a danger. The first people that you think about are your closest family members. You know, if there's a fire in your house, if there's danger, if you're in a state of panic, you, you automatically want to make sure that your wife, your parents, your children are taken care of. But on the Day of Judgment, we're talking about a, a new type of fear. It's not, this is not the typical fear that we have in this earthly life. The Prophet says, There are three times 
there are three stations in the year after where no one is going to remember anybody. You know, for example, when, you, when you're in your grave, you're going to yearn, you're going to think about your family. You're going you're gonna to be thinking about others. When you're in Adam al barzakh for example, you will think about your family. You will yearn for them to come and visit your grave. You will want to... So, so you, there are certain stations in the hereafter where there will be a desire to connect with your family and you will think about them. But the Prophet says there are three moments, there are three stations that we will all pass through where we will not think about anybody. What are these three stations? عند الميزان حتى يمر أيثقل ميزان أم يخف أم أم يخف أم يخف When the deeds are being weighed and assessed, Allah doesn't just count your deeds; He evaluates the quality of your actions. So when our deeds are being weighed. None of us are going to be concerned about the other. In fact, we have some narrations that say the father will come, you know, and after the, you know, the, the scales are weighed, the father will come to the son or the daughter and ask and say to them that I, I only need one hasana to tip the scale for me. And the, the child will deny the parent. So the Prophet says when the, during the Mizan, when the deeds are being weighed on the scales, no one will think about anyone else. وَعِنْدَ السِّرَاطِ When When we cross the bridge over the hellfire, some narrations say that it takes a thousand years, it takes three thousand years to cross that bridge. One thousand years is the ascent, 1,000 years, you're, it's a vertical cross, and then 1,000 is a descent into near the gates of paradise. So when you're crossing the sirat in the hereafter, you're not going to think about anybody. Your only concern is for you to cross. So when your deeds are being weighed, the only thing that you're thinking about is ensuring that you have more good deeds than evil deeds. You're not thinking about any, anyone or anything else. When you're crossing the sirat, you're not thinking about anyone else. Your only goal is to just cross. And then the third is, وَعِنْدَ الصُّحُفْ حَتَّى يَنْظُرُ بِيَمِينِهِ يَأْخُذُ الصُّحُفْ أَمْ بِشِمَانِ And when the, the book of our deeds, the qiyamati form of our deeds, which come in the form of this book, when they're returned to us, Everyone is worried, will I receive it with my right hand or my left? So the Prophet says, These three stations, no one will remember anyone. You're not going to remember a friend, a relative, a, a child, a parent. You are, you are fully disengaged from the rest of creation. And then the Prophet says, this is the meaning of the ayah, that every individual will be preoccupied on the day of judgment, which is mentioned in Surah Habasa, Surah 80, verse 37. Verse number 98, Allah says, إِنَّكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ حَصَبُ جَهَنَّمْ أنتم لها واردون. Surely you and that which you worship apart from God shall be fuel for hell. Unto it you shall come. So you have the worshippers and you have the worshipped. So you have the idol worshipper and the idol. Allah says both of them will be Hasad of Jahannam. Now the word, you know, there are some Orientalists who looked at this verse and they said, we found an error in the Quran because the word for, the word, they say the word should be Hatab. 
with a meaning ta with a line on top of the sad hatab and not hasan because the the verse is essentially saying that they will be like the firewood of hellfire however in the arabic language the arabic language see many of these people they don't they don't know classical arabic the word hatab with a ta means wood that you throw into fire meaning it's it's firewood whereas haslab is anything that fuels the fire so if i take off my shirt or i throw in you know a plastic cup or anything a rag a shoe that is called haslab fuel that is not not wood so again that's not a, a legitimate uh, criticism of the verse. So Allah says, Surely you and that which you worship apart from God shall be fuel for hell. Unto it you shall come. Now, what's interesting about the hellfire is that what we understand from this verse is that the fuel for, for the hellfire are the objects of worship and people themselves. Meaning that this verse indicates that the punishment, that hell is actually emanating from the human soul. Because Allah says, you are the fuel of, of hell. Which, which means what? Without you, there is no hell. So the pain and the agony and the suffering, the source of it is where? Where is it coming from? It's all emanating from the depths of the human soul. So there is no Jahannam, meaning hellfire is not something that exists independently of the human soul. Allah in the Quran says, you know, قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا you know, and in another verse, Allah says, النار التي وقودها الناس والحجارة. Fear a hell whose fuel is people and stones. Meaning, the hell fire has no independent reality. Meaning that the reality of hell is, is rooted in the human soul. Now, what you find here is that when this verse was revealed, some of the mushrikeen, they, you know, because many of the, the Jews used to ask the Quraysh, you know, about any new verses that were revealed. So when one of the, the individuals from Bani Israel heard about this verse, he told the mushrikeen that. I have a rebuttal. I have a criticism of this ayah. Go tell Muhammad that based on this ayah, Allah is saying that you and whoever you worship will be in hell. So go tell Muhammad, how about Isa ibn Maryam? If, if, if Allah is saying in this verse that you and whatever you worship other than God will be the fuel of hell. So does that mean Ruzayr? who's a prophet, is going, is going to be burned in hell. Does that mean Jesus Christ, Maryam is worshipped by certain people, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is worshipped by certain individuals who attribute uluhiyah to him? So they say that based on this verse, you're going to end up throwing many righteous people in Jahannam because Allah says you and whatever you worshipped will be the fuel of the hellfire. Now, the response is twofold. Now, when you look at the ayah, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Innakum wa ma ta'buduna min dunillah hasabu jahannam. You and that which you worship, the Allah says, Wa ma ta'buduna min dunillah. Allah didn't say, Surely you and who you worship. Allah didn't say, إِنَّكُمْ وَمَنْ Men 
refers to intelligible beings. It refers to people. Ma refers to inanimate objects. So this is one uh, refutation. The ayah says is referring to the inanimate objects that people worshipped. But for the sake of argument, let's say that ma is sometimes used for people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we'll speak about this in more detail uh, next week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say in ayah number 101? He says, Inna ladina sabaqat lahum minna al husna. Surely, as for those from whom good has already reached from us, ulaika anha mub'adun. They shall be kept far away from it. So, Allah here makes an exception that those who receive divine grace, those who, will, who were wrongly worshipped, who never claimed divinity, who never asked people to worship them, Allah says, they will be removed, they will be distanced from the hellfire. And in fact, Allah on the day of judgment, He has a conversation with Isa alayhi salam. Ya Isa ibn Maryam, anta qulta lil nas attakhiduni wa ummi ilahini min dun Allah. O Isa, did you, did you tell people to worship me and my mother as gods other than God? And you find that Isa alayhi salam denies, he denies that, he rejects that. Uh, that claim. I want to also draw your attention to the word waridun at the end of the ayah, end of ayah number 98. Allah says, Surely you and that which you worship apart from God shall be fuel for hell. Unto it you shall come. Now, in the English translation, it's it, it doesn't capture the 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 beautiful meaning of the word waridun. Waridun means to go to a water hole, it's to go to a place, it's basically where animals go to drink water. It's when you take an animal to a water hole. Now, and this is why, for example, in the story of Musa, Allah uses the same verb. When he came to the wells of Median. Why did he go to the wells of Median? What was pushing him? Did anyone force him? No, his thirst led him to the wells of Median. Meaning, the word warada means that there is something inside of the person that draws them to this location. An animal does not need to be forced to go to the pond to drink. It does it willingly meaning it is it is naturally drawn to the watering place and this is a very profound meaning brothers and sisters here allah is saying that these people that go to jahannam they are drawn to jahannam because of their nature and tum laha waridun it you know they're not there is something within them that draws them to the hellfire. So yet, there is suffering, but there is an affinity between them and the hellfire. They are drawn to it in the same way an animal is drawn to a water hole. And then Allah says in ayah number 99, Had these been gods, they would not have come on to it. Each shall dwell in hell forever. You, uh, the person and their object of worship will be with them in the hellfire. Because anything that you, that you invest hope in, anything that you try to seek refuge in other than Allah, becomes the source of your agony. You know, even in this life, the things that you pursue in order to find peace and happiness, they actually end up becoming the source of your misery. You know, if you make the pursuit of money, if money is your God, believe me, the source of your agony and your suffering will be the money itself. You know, even if you look at rich people, yes, they enjoy their money, 
But at the same time, their money is also the source of their stress. People who are very beautiful, they're very attractive. Yes, they benefit from their beauty, but also their beauty becomes the bane of their existence. For example, think of a beautiful woman. She enjoys her beauty. She flaunts her beauty. But her beauty also becomes a source of what? It attracts a lot of harassment. It becomes, you know, she always feels like there's someone who's more attractive. There is this kind of relentless pursuit of this perfect body or this perfect face. It becomes the source of their suffering. So Allah says the object of your worship, if it's other than God, becomes the fuel of hell because it, 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 is, it becomes the source of your agony, becomes the source of your suffering. So Allah says if these, it had these been gods, they would not have entered hell, meaning they would not be the fuel of hell because a god is not meant to be the source of your agony. So whatever you're chasing after, in this life, whatever your God is, whether it's the ego, whether it's money, whether it's an idol, whether it's you know an idea that is foreign to God and, and, the, and the religion of God, that thing will be the source of your suffering. The power itself, the money, the beauty, women, whatever it is, it becomes the source of your agony. And each of it will dwell in the hellfire forever. Now, a person only remains in hell if they refuse to change their nature, right? So the soul is the fuel, a corrupt soul is the fuel for the hellfire. Now, there are some souls that can be salvaged they can be reformed through this process of purification but a soul that is rebellious and re a soul that refuses to be reformed a soul that is so corrupt where we can no longer remove the corruption from the heart it, it remains there forever you know there are some qualities there are some spiritual contaminants that can be pressurized you know just like when you want to clean your driveway sometimes you need a pressure hose you need something forceful to remove the dirt if it's really embedded in the cement but you know if the soul has a, a, a terminal illness that's when it remains in the hellfire forever so if the if the soul has the capacity to change it will not remain in hellfire forever and there are only a handful of souls that are that dark and corrupt where you know the the evil the wickedness is a part of their nature and and there's nothing that you can do about it that is when the the suffering and the uh the uh you know being in the hellfire becomes eternal and then ayah number 100, and we'll conclude here. لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يَسْمَعُونَ Theirs shall be groaning therein, and therein they shall not hear. There are two words in the Arabic language, and that is zafir. Zafir means to exhale. And shahiq means to inhale. Now, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hud, Surah 11, ayah number 106, He mentions both. He says, لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَشَهِيقٌ That the, the inmates of hell, they will exhale, meaning that they will expel things from their body and they will absorb things into their body. And both of them are wretched. You know, what, what they take in is foul and what they expel perhaps is even more foul because they're expelling pus and all of these, you know, very unpleasant things. So, Zafir and Shahiq are both mentioned, but here it only mentions Zafir, perhaps to just draw our attention to the, to the more awful of the two, which is 
what is being expelled from the bodies of these individuals. And then Allah says, وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يَسْمَعُونَ And in it, they shall not hear. Now, some of the Mufassireen of the Qur'an, they say, this means that they will be deaf. They will actually not be able to hear because they were spiritually deaf in dunya. And if you're spiritually deaf in dunya, you will be deaf. Your qiyamati form, your body will lack that faculty. Others say that fiha la yasma'un, meaning that they will not hear the suffering of other inmates. You know, one of the things about you know being a prisoner is that when you know that when you hear others, it, it makes you feel like you know you have company. So it, it makes the suffering a little bit more bearable because you're aware of the presence of other people. So means some have said that it means that they experience the suffering utterly alone. So even though there are others in Jannah, each person feels that they are enduring the suffering alone in complete isolation. And you find that one of the most painful torch most painful torture methods, even in modern times, is what? It's uh you know, solitary confinement. You don't hear anything. You're just alone. So it seems that some scholars have understood وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يَسْمَعُونَ is an indication that, that they, will, they will experience this physical and this psychological pain in complete isolation because they have lost the, the faculty of hearing. Uh, with that, inshallah, we'll conclude our session for tonight and we'll open up the floor for Q&A wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tahirin Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad Assalamualaikum uh, shaykh do you have any thoughts uh, related to verse 95 uh, and the sources of protection from God's punishment? Do you have any thoughts on why the process, like the, on the, what the cause and effect is of what might cause the Prophet's presence and people seeking forgiveness to God might cause them protection from God's punishment? And like, it seems like the presence of God might perhaps induce people to seek God's forgiveness. So that perhaps might be a correlation. It could be, it could be, but, you know, it seems that this is just a type of, uh, of divine grace that has been given to the, uh, the prophet. And it's, it's a way of honoring the prophet. You know, in the past, you know, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would annihilate entire civilizations, entire communities because of their, uh, because of their rebelliousness and their, their evil actions. But you know, to honor the Prophet because he is the declared mercy to the worlds, it seems that his his presence, you know, whether whether just interacting with him reminds you of God and the mercy of God. I mean, there are many who met, met the Prophet and still refused and in fact fought him. But because he is Rahmatan Lil Alameen and because he is the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah says, you know, as a courtesy to the Prophet. I will not subject you to the same punishment that past nations uh, experienced. So, so this shows you that even those who fought the prophet, even those who you know, resisted the prophet and opposed him, benefited from the fact that they, they didn't experience this kind of mass uh, annihilation as others did. Yeah, I guess even the previous prophets, some of them who had their cities destroyed, still had followers who were asking for forgiveness and they were saved with the prophets. Yeah, yes. And uh, also, do you know what is the meaning of the title of Zulqarnain? Is there a... So Zulqarnain, again, there, the, unfortunately, there's not a consensus on that either. Some, some have said that if you take it literally, Qarn means a horn. 
So Dhal Qarnain means the one with two horns, and it could be a reference to the uh, a helm, a type of medieval helmet that he used to wear. This is maybe one explanation. Others say Qarn also means you know century, right, or two periods. So it could be that you know he lived for for an extended period of time where he was part of two distinct periods of time or two distinct uh, decades. So uh, these are just some of the uh, theories related to why uh, he's, he's called Dil Qarnayn. And there are others, but I would have to consult with the, uh, the Tafasiyah. But, it, but it's an honorific title that was given to him, and it, it wasn't his actual name. And in the verse that says, um, Fear a hell whose fuel is people and stones, what what are the stones uh, a reference to? So the stones, according to the, the main opinion, the dominant view of the Mufassirin, the stones represent, of course, obviously it refers to the physical, uh, you know, uh, stones that people used to worship, especially in the past. But it can also, you know, we know that even even things that are intangible, that are abstract, take on a form in, in the hereafter. You know, everything that we do, every thought, every action has a dunyawi form, it has a barzakhi form, and it has a qiyamati form. So, for example, your prayers, you know, in the, in the dunya, you can't point at your prayers. It's, it's not something tangible. I mean, yeah, you are offering your prayers, but the prayer that you're offering is not something that you can touch. It doesn't have a, a form. But in, in Barzakh and in, in the hereafter, it actually has a form. So it seems that the objects of our worship will take on a form in, on the, uh, in the hereafter, and especially in the hellfire, where they're essentially stone, meaning that they have nothing to offer you other than the fact that they contribute to the uh, the uh, the fuel of hell, meaning that they they have no other role except that they become a reason why hell is is unpleasant. They become a fuel in the hellfire. And just as I mentioned that, just, I mean, it goes back to this idea that when when the human being orients himself towards anything other than God, and they have this hope of attaining peace and salvation and you know, happiness, that thing, you know, ironically becomes the, the source of their suffering. And, and we experience that to a much lesser extent in this life. Now, everything in the hereafter is amplified. It's, it's a lot more real. It's a lot more visceral. So the, the agony and everything is, uh, is enhanced because the limitations and the restrictions of our existence are lifted. You know, the moment we die, we are able to see things. Our, our vision becomes more sharp. All of our senses become enhanced because we're entering into a new world. Thank, uh, thank you. And uh, there are two questions that have been asked, which are fairly similar, so I'll just combine them both. Uh, one question was, can your children become a source of... Can your children... I'm sorry, it cut off. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, one question was, can your children become a source of your suffering if you love them too much? And the other question was, what makes it different for things like ambitions, decisions, or children to not become a source of your shirk and prevent agony? So, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, explicitly mentions, you know, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna, That surely your, your wealth and your children are a trial for you. And these are typically the things that we, we become very attached to. You know, we're very protective and attached to our money. You know, that, that's why, you know, if the stock market goes down or if, you know, if, if you lose a considerable amount of money, you suffer and it, you, you can potentially get depressed and it causes you great anxiety. And the same thing goes with your children. You know, you're very protective over them. But, you know, the way that you don't allow that to be become an unhealthy attachment is that you have to remind yourself that it doesn't belong to you 
you know, I think constantly reminding yourself that whatever you possess, whether it's your wealth, whether it's your children, doesn't and never actually belong to you to begin with. You have to see everything as a trust. You know, in the same way that, you know, if I, if I give you a loan, you're going to be very careful about, you know, that loan. You're not going to, you're not going to treat it as your own. You're going to, you're going to preserve it and then you're going to return it to the owner. So we have to have that mindset with respect to our children. The, the actual owner has a certain expectation regarding how should we deal with this wealth. The actual owner of our children, the creator, has certain expectations. And we have to, we have to kind of uh, meet those expectations. We have to put in our best effort. So, you know, the way that you, and it's easier said than done. I mean, that's, there's no denying that. But uh, reminding yourself that these are trusts, these are things that have been entrusted to you and they don't, uh, they don't belong to you. Now with money, the way that you kind of break that attachment is, is fairly simple in the sense that you have to get yourself into the habit of regularly giving charity, not just in the month of Ramadan, Laylatul Qadr, you pull out a $20 bill and you think, Alhamdulillah, it, it, it requires constant effort. It requires consistency. You know, in the same way that, you know, you have to, you have to eat foods that boost your immune system so you don't get sick. You know, giving charity is a type of uh, spiritual uh, immunization against hubbud dunya. Now, when it comes to, to your children, you have to, you, you cannot give in to their needs if what they want is antithetical to the, the values of Islam. That it, if you have to make a decision between doing what's going to make your kids happy or doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects of you, then the, the, the decision is, uh, is obvious. You know, for example, sometimes as, as parents, you know, on the weekends, sometimes we feel sorry for our kids. You know, they have to wake up 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday. Now let them, let them sleep in. You know, my, my 15-year-old, 16-year-old, let them sleep in. You have an obligation to, to wake them up for, for Salat al-Fajr. So this is an example of how sometimes you let your emotions get the best of you. Now, yes, they might, they might not, you know, they might be, annoyed by you but you're doing your job you know your job is not to always make your kids happy you know sometimes we make this mistake as parents we always want to make them happy we always want to you know but sometimes you know not every kid wants to brush their teeth before they go to bed you don't give it you don't compromise on that because you care about their oral oral hygiene you think every kid wants to go to school no you force them to go because it's good for them. They need it. Why is it that when it comes to Salat al-Fajr, we say, oh, it's not a big deal. So in the same way you force your kids to go to school and you force them to brush your teeth and you force them to, to eat healthy, you don't compromise on that. Same thing goes for hijab. Same thing goes for, you know, Salah. Same thing goes. So as parents, you have to influence them. You know, you know we talk about, you know, influencers. On social media influencers on you you as a parent you have to be an influencer and the way that you influence them is that they see you as a friend as someone that they can confide in someone who who who, who talks to them who comes from a place of care and you can't you can't just bark orders at your kids you know you can't be a dictator in, in the same way that you give them constructive criticism you also have to praise their accomplishments there needs to be a balance Allah is like that with us. You think Allah is only threatening us with Jahannam? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a balance between glad tidings and warnings. So I think we have to, we have to apply that same, uh, that same approach. Um, do, do you know if there's a, if the ratio is known on how often there's like glad tidings given versus warnings? Because they say in research today, nowadays, they're saying that, hey, you should have a five to one ratio of like good to bad to have a positive relationship with someone. I'm wondering if there's something similar. So, that that's in, that's an, that's interesting. I haven't actually done a calculation of of the verses uh, where Allah gives glad tidings or gives warning, but I would imagine that there are more verses that speak about paradise, that speak about Allah's mercy. In fact, 
I know this for sure. Out of the 99 names of God, and some of them, some of the, the names of God is that he's, he's the one who seeks revenge. You know, he is, uh, so there are some names that highlight certain aspects of his wrath. But in the Quran, the most emphasized, if you count, the most emphasized attribute of Allah in the Quran is his rahmah. And then second is his knowledge. So in this idea of he, he, know, he cares and he knows, right? So remembering that Allah cares for you, he loves you, and you know, and you, you, you know, someone might care for you, but and they love, but they might not know anything about you. They might not know how to help you, but Allah cares. He's merciful and He knows. So His, He's so His rahma is the most emphasized, and then second to His rahma is His knowledge. There's this constant reminder that He knows all things. He knows. He knows what you speak, and He knows what you conceal in your heart. And um, a bit of a commentary on comment on the previous class is also touches into this class. Um, in the last verse, we talked about how uh, those people with both good deeds and belief, their actions will not be denied. And kind of just think about like why that would be true, especially why, why is belief needed in addition to deeds? And it kind of ties into how, uh, it seems like it ties into how heaven and hell manifest in this world first. And that the good deeds are might be beneficial to us really when we have a certain mindset when we're performing them. That's yeah. not just the action itself. So if you're helping others, even if you might think that you're trying to do good for them, but you really need to be motivated just as much out of a desire to help them and as little bit by ego or any other negative thing that's gonna affect of how like have an effect on what what effect the action actually has on you yourself. It's yeah. kind of more related to how you benefit from it and how. You know, you know, I, I would also add to that that I think even intuitively, we know. I, mean, I think intuitively, we we recognize that there is a difference between someone who's feeding the poor willingly because they care, and someone who's doing the same action, but they despise the people that they're feeding. They're doing it begrudgingly. Can you say that those two actions are the same? Now, outwardly, they may look exactly the same, but Islam says, no, the, the spirit behind the action also matters. When the Quran says, you know, having belief and doing good deeds, we're not just talking about the beliefs that you claim to have. We're talking about what you really believe. You know, and, you know, in this life, there are many people who are legally Muslim, meaning that they fit the fiqhi meaning of Muslim. They said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So they're Muslim in the, in the legal sense. But how many people are actually Muslim in, in the real sense, where they actually believe in God? They actually believe in the hereafter. In, you know, in the hereafter, there may be many people who are actually kuffar, who we thought are, were Muslims. They claimed to believe certain things, but only Allah knows what we act, what we really believe, and what you really believe. I'm not talking about what we claim to believe. What you really believe becomes the basis for your actions. I think any rational person will tell you that, that your actions stem from your belief system, your actual belief system. And that is what is judged on the day of judgment. What you really believed. Anyone can claim. I mean, the munafiqeen, that, that, I mean, that's the definition of a hypocrite. Munafiqeen claimed we believe in God, we believe in, believes in the messenger of God. Is that belief going to benefit them? That's a stated belief. That's a claimed belief. But belief is something that is much deeper than just what's on the tongue. It's the motivation. It's your direction in life, your, you know, your worldview. And that shapes your behavior. And that's why belief is the most important thing in the hereafter, because that is what shapes your behavior.